Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone's having a great uh, February 14th. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm Brian Lapidus, and I lead Kroll's identity theft and breach notification practice. We work with clients who've experienced a data breach to help them respond to the event, communicate with those impacted, provide some remedy to those who are impacted, those consumers or employees who are impacted, and then work with the organizations to recover. Today, I'm pleased to be able to present with my colleagues at Infinite Global. Zach? Everybody, I'm Zach Olson. I'm the president of Infinite Global. Infinite Global is an international communications agency that helps organizations thoughtfully plan for and strategically respond to breaches and other cyber threats. A good PR team understands the life cycle of a breach and the roles and responsibilities of the forensics investigators, legal counsel, and the victimized organization. And when working in harmony, the breach response team can help an organization reduce the impact of a breach on its customers, employees, and partners, mitigate the risk of subsequent litigation, save time and money for both the organization and its cyber insurer, and minimize the damage to the organization, its brand, and bottom line. And on the phone with me today is my colleague, Kelsey Idbo, who helps our, build our crisis communications playbooks for our clients and respond to breaches when they have them. We're going to talk a lot about how to optimize the role of the PR firm um, today because there's, there's some confusion around what a PR firm does and how they interact with forensics and legal to help a client navigate a breach. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Zach. And, and it, you know, I, I like to think that from a, you know, part of the reason we are presenting together today is really around our the importance of these two types of functions working together and Kroll and Infinite do a lot of work together in this. So we are um, <laughs> well poised to talk about these events and how we can support, how we support each other and our clients as they're working through these challenges. Can you flip to the next slide, Leo? Great. Thank you. So to get us started, I think it's best to set the stage a bit. Now, you see six different companies on here, and I promise we're not, we're not picking on these six organizations at all, but I think um, they're all recognizable brands. They all caught headlines, um, and they caught the interest, uh, <laughs> for better or for worse, worse of states, um, government officials, and most critical, customers and consumers as a whole when these events happened. Um, all of these organizations had a lot of information to lose. Um, smaller organizations can be wiped out when these events happen and they're not prepared. Unfortunately, we've seen many clients um, or heard of many companies who have had these events and didn't have the resources to deal with them and, and shut, it, shut, you know, shut their doors um, because they weren't able to, um, they weren't able to handle the rigor, both from a, just handling the event up front as well as dealing with the repercussions on the back end. Um, I think it's also important to note that not only are the, is the institution impacted, but often the consumers or the customers of that organization are impacted as well. And that impact lasts far beyond the initial um, media hit and, and, and content that is out about the event itself. Zach? Definitely. And yeah, and these are, these are good examples of massive breaches that were made worse by misguided PR responses. I mean, these are, they're tough events to, to respond to just because of the complexity of the logistics. But, but because these are familiar brands, um, we can look to them as, as case studies and, and sort of illustrate why, why it's important to have these things planned out ahead of time. So these companies they either took too long to respond publicly provided inaccurate or, mis or misleading information to the public, um, and along the way lost credibility by having to go back and correct that information. And, and I think the sale of Yahoo to Verizon um, is a really clear and dramatic example of how a bad breach can cost an organization and shareholders real money. Agreed. Significant money. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, so uh, you know, the incident itself is just the beginning. And one of the things, you know, if you look at this slide, you know, it, it's, it's, it's easy, I guess, to talk about some of the core costs, but, you know, 
you know, as Zach, he was just so, Zach was just alluding to some of the uh, longer term tail costs, like corporate valuation that impacted uh, Verizon and, um, excuse me, and Yahoo. But, you know, I think one of the things to look at are there, around costs is that there's all sorts of costs to think about. So, unfortunately, I, I'm going to pick on Target now for a minute. Um, you know, and most people are familiar with that event. It happened in December of 2013, and people still remember it, and they hold it up as an example, often as the costs associated with brand and reputation impact. So after that breach, Target's customer traffic hit its lowest point in three years. And if you remember, it happened in, you know, in, in sort of, I think it was November or December. So it was right during holiday shopping um, for, for, you know, and, and it, it, the, fa the fact that their customer traffic hit its lowest point had a significant impact. 33% um, of U.S. households shopped at Target in 2014, compared with 43% the previous January. So a 10% drop in U.S. households is significant, you know, in terms of people and you know people shopping in the stores. But imagine the ramifications of that from a dollar perspective. Um, at the time, it was reported that Target, Target saw declines in many of their key customer groups, especially Gen X shoppers. Uh, that, that population segment itself declined from 53% to 38% the following year after the breach. So um, customer turnover rates, reputation impact, and diminished goodwill all have a lasting impact. Um, on the business and impact not only the you know you have the initial cost of handling handling the event, but it's that revenue stream and that recovery on the back end that's also impacted that I think a lot of organizations fail to think about. Now, you could probably tell this from the title of our presentation and what we've spoken about so far, but you know a strong and a strategic communication plan when dealing with a data breach response is critical. The moment customers learn of a breach, a company's brand reputation always takes a hit. And so the job of everyone involved is to minimize that hit. Now, a, a thoughtful and thorough crisis communication plan allows the business to minimize its reputational damage and also begin restoring customer trust from their first announcement through all the touch points. Um, through resolution of the incident. So, you know, an example would be, you know, we've seen companies who come out and say, yes, we've had an event and we've impacted this amount of data. You know, 48 hours later, they're changing their story. That doesn't instill a lot of confidence. In the in the market and in the in, in customers because they're they're hearing it so they're hearing it and they're hearing bits and pieces of it. So one of the things that we like to do collectively with with our our clients and people that we're organizations we're working with is to make sure they have a really good picture of what happened, understand um, the details in a way that allows them to be clear and concise in their comms, and then make sure that it's in line with. The, you know, with, with what the customer um, is used to hearing. So if, if um, you know, an example of that, and, and we've, we've seen this as well, a customer, it was a, it was a, it was an, a communication in a newspaper and they used the wrong Pantone color of the logo in the ad. Well, that wasn't commensurate with the organization. It was actually kind of a, a, a messy situation for that client who did that, right? They, 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 that, that, set, that responsibility sat with them. And the tone of the alert, the advertisement, if you will, didn't reflect their culture. And so people really called it into question. And, and so those are the nuances and the things that as an organization, you've got to be mindful of in terms of communication. I guess finally on this point, um, before I let Kelsey chime in, you know, providing a real remedy for those consumers that are impacted are, is really, really important. Um, you you want that consumer to have a um, have a positive feeling. Yes, they've been impacted, or they may have been impacted. Their data may have been compromised. But the more you can build an affinity or foster that affinity and goodwill between the customer and the organization, the better off. Um, that organization is going to be as it relates to customer churn. Kelsey? Yeah, and Brian, I just want to jump in real quick too. Something that we haven't talked about yet is is the complexity with which responding to these incidents is, um, and the and one of the most 
often overlooked but most important audiences is the is the internal one at a client right so um, one of the challenges with communicating about a breach is that we often don't have all of the information um, in the first days and the first weeks of an investigation so so if you can buy your buy yourself some time with the internal audiences the the folks that are working for your organization and might be talking about a breach before it's public um, the more runway you have to to be able to communicate externally in a way that's accurate and thoughtful later down the line. So it's important not to forget about those internal employee audiences as well, because they can be um, they can be either great supporters or great agitators when these events happen. Yeah, and I think um, to the points that both Brian and Zach have been making, just making sure there's a plan in place ahead of time so you understand who needs to be involved, what their roles are, and when the actual incident hits, who needs to be involved in the response that can just make sure that a lot of those messy components like having the wrong Pantone color in your logo or um, or communicating inconsistently, you minimize the risk of that happening because everybody understands their role and everybody understands when it's their turn to step in. So I, I think one of the things that I, I want to hit on, and I'm, I'm sensitive to time because I know we are, um, we, we scheduled a short, we wanted this to be a snippet, a snippet webinar to just give some highlights. Um, but I think, you know, being mindful of um, the costs and the fines, timing is important. Um, you know, all 50 states now have laws and things, uh, have breach notification laws that impact timing of when to notify. So making sure that as an organization, you have a, a plan in place and you understand um, timelines to, to help avoid and avoid fines and minimize legal costs are really, really critical, um, you know, as it relates to, you know, the overall cost stemming from these events. Next slide, slide, please. please. So we've talked a bit about customer churn, and there's no question that data breaches cause this type of uh, churn for customers. You know, I think this data is really interesting, and I, I want to highlight it for a couple of reasons. The main reason being there is a real risk to an organization who doesn't handle these events well, and don't think about the customer impact. So if you look at, you know, if you if you look through this slide for merchants. General merchants, 33% of those consumers are changing providers after an event. For healthcare, 30%. For financial institutions, 24%. And I look at the healthcare one, and that one has always sort of you know struggled. I, you know, it's kind of blown me away, quite frankly. I may choose to have surgery at a hospital, but I would choose a different facility afterwards because they lost my data. So if you think about you know, the healthcare world is so competitive right now, and there's such there's such industry challenges there anyway, um, to, to lose around a third of your customers due to a security breach and data compromise, potential data compromise, is really an, an additional wrinkle and complexity in the market that I'm not sure you know 10 years ago hospitals thought about. So you know again, takeaway here is really around understanding that your customers um, are interested in, um, you know, are, are gonna be interested in your competitors if you mistreat them. And an example of mistreating them is compromising and losing their data. So much like chess, your strategy has to be put put you in a position to defend what's most important. And in this particular case, the sensitive data that could be involved in a just, it, it, this, the most important information is that sensitive data that could be involved in a data breach. When it comes to security, this is the definition of a defensible strategy and a communication plan and how you're communicating um, during and after an event is a key pillar in that strategy. And so with that, Zach and Kelsey, why don't you talk a bit about about communication and how it fits in, um, in, in both pre and post event. Sure. Yeah. So when we talk about optimizing the role of PR um, in a breach, it's really well before an incident that you can have the greatest impact um, on how a breach is received by the stakeholders in your organization cares about. Um, Kelsey will dive a little bit into what into what that looks like for us. Uh, so. In addition to just making sure you have an experienced outside public relations team on hand and, and on call for us if something happens, part of the planning process is to make sure 
that you get to know them ahead of using them. So your first interaction between the PR firm and your marketing department, the PR firm and your GC, PR firm and your C-suite is not in the midst of a crisis. Um, introduce the team across your in-house response team and explain why you've hired them. We've seen in multiple incidents that we'll get on the phone after a breach and somebody pipes up on the line and says, so why do we have a PR firm? And their, their concern is that they've widened the circle beyond the forensics investigators um, and the legal team on the line. So understanding why, you're involved, why the PR firm is involved ahead of time um, will really help expedite the response. Um, ensure all incident response team members have your agency's contact information within reach. So when that incident does happen, they know exactly who to call and when. Um, and then also develop a crisis communications playbook that at the very least has the name and contact information of the full response team, um, names and contact information for your PR agency and other vendors, and a list of internal and external audiences that can just serve as a checklist as you're going through your response time. Um, also media policy should be included so your full firm is well aware of when they should be responding to media inquiries um, and when they should be, which typically should not be, they should be passing them along to the marketing department. Um, a comprehensive playbook should also hold response steps, um, prerequisites for going public, potential vulnerabilities, holding statements, and some statement prompts. So when a scenario arises, again, you have that checklist you can go through and make sure you're really covering all your bases. Um, make sure to test the plan so everybody understands their role. And you'll, you'll see in that role that people probably aren't going to respond the same way they would actually during an incident, but you'll also see how people respond and it will help people practice. So once an incident occurs, they understand where, when it's their turn to step in. Um, and then also just make sure to plan, plan to update your playbook. It seems like a very basic um, guideline, but you don't wanna be post-crisis and thinking, wait, we went through a rebrand, so where is, our or where, where is this file saved? Um, or think that you've changed kind of your messaging so this statement isn't really accurate anymore. Just make sure all of that is taken care of ahead of time. Um, so once you have your playbook site, you're going to be in a much better place to respond post-breach, which Zach, we can go over at this point. Yeah, thanks, Kelsey. And I think the, the overarching message there is that everybody knows that breaches are going to happen. People are used to them, but the expectation has changed so that now if you're not an organization that's prepared to respond to a breach, you're behind the curve. And plaintiff's lawyers and insurance companies and customers and shareholders are expecting that that organizations are prepared for these things, um, and and we can help you. We can help you get there. So so a breach hits. Now what? What is a what does a good PR firm do? Um, they'll they'll help your organization understand the media landscape that's specific to you and your industry. So who are the reporters and influencers that can affect public opinion here, and how do we reach them? Uh, the media cycle of the data breach. What are the news triggers? Um, how do we get ready for them so we're not caught off guard? How to communicate with critical audiences um, through a breach? Which channels do we use? Who's our spokesperson? Um, what, what kind of tone and style do we use when talking to our customers? And how do we mirror that now that we're mired in a crisis so that we don't make it worse on ourselves? Um, when and how to leverage social media? What's the organization's social footprint? And how do we leverage those channels to communicate with the audiences we care about in a way that is still in line with the goals of the legal team so that we're mitigating our, our, our risk of litigation? Uh, managing the expectations of interested versus affected parties. We've worked on a bunch of breaches where um, there is a, there's some gray area between the folks that need to know what happened and the, and the people that are simply interested um, in what happened and knowing how to communicate with both of those so that we don't um, that we don't alienate anyone, anyone is very important. Um, maintaining consistency of messaging when communicating across various platforms. How do we take that initial holding statement that is sent out and manifest it into a notification letter um, and an interview with the media and a letter to the shareholders? All of the things that we need to communicate about the breach need to be consistent so that, again, we don't run, we don't run or increase the risk of litigation down the road. And then lastly, when to be proactive, reactive, or quiet. Our goal is to avoid litigation um, and fines from regulators. So there are times, especially when we don't have all of the information about the facts of the breach, um, that you need to simply be quiet. There's no other way around it. How, when can we be proactive and talk to our audiences in a way that's going to help them feel confident that we're being transparent with them? And again, how do we react to the media 
in a way that's strategic and thoughtful. So um, to kind of recap what Zach's been going over, you know, the role of a PR agency in this incident isn't to cover up a data breach or to spin it into something it isn't, but it's really to manage the communications process in a way that's going to minimize the negative attention and reputational risk while restoring trust to your audiences. Um, these strategies include using potential news triggers to anticipate the news cycle, such as when the notifications are going to go out, um, to determine how to react or not figuring out what an ideal outcome looks like and how to get there, as well as what a worst case scenario looks like and what to do if we end up there. Um, we'll serve as an intermediary, intermediary with the media when necessary to ensure we're keeping up with requests, we're not missing the opportunity to tell our side of the story if appropriate, and we're preventing the spread of inaccurate information. Also, using a third party um, expert will help balance the needs and expectations of various team members when it comes to how to speak with audiences and ensure there is a consistent voice and message throughout all communications, um, as Zach mentioned. So there are, also, there are often differences between what different parties involved in the crisis want to be doing. The legal team probably wants to say little to nothing, but the client is familiar with the audiences and, and wants to keep them updated. So just having an external party to advise on, um, on the best way to do that is, is, uh, can be very helpful in that situation. Um, pointing back to just consistent consistency throughout the communications, you know, that's what really can can continue building trust when when customers are getting the right information um, throughout. And so, on the next slide, we have an example of a notification letter, which is what a lot of a lot of what we use to kind of distill that information down um, into what the audiences care about. So, this is going to be the basis for the information going out, and how do we use this to communicate with internal, external audiences, media, and other stakeholders. Um, so I'll let Brian go through kind of what this notification letter looks like in that process. Thanks, Kelsey. So, you know, and I think Zach said this right before we got on the call, but I, so I'm gonna give him credit for it, but I'm gonna steal it. The notification is the official party line, right? It is, it is what the organization um, is committing to in terms of their story, right? And everything, so, so it, it's a really important piece of information um, that serves as the, as the base, if you will, of, of the narrative moving forward. Um, you know, I think there are lots of things to consider and I want to just touch on a couple quickly. You know, is it going is is the letter going out under one one letterhead or one brand or is it multiple brands? Um, which is, you know, seems like a simple uh decision, but a lot of times the person getting the letter may not recognize if it was a third party vendor, which we see a lot of these days in terms of third parties compromising the data the consumer or the person receiving the letter is not going to recognize that logo. Um, you know, you can see uh, different versions of a letter and how do you manage that? You can see different uh, languages, different variable text fields, all of the nuances that go into a letter. Um, this isn't a, um, it, this isn't the equivalent of, you know, having a, uh, an assembly line <laughs> set up with uh, someone stuffing and licking envelopes. Um, it just it, it it there's a lot more complexity to that. So I want to kind of talk about a couple of things on the next slide, which we'll get into some of the mechanics. Um, so and, and and mechanics in terms of things to avoid and things to to be conscious of when going through this process. So number one, you know, I think it reflects, and I know it reflects poorly when uh, one individual gets multiple letters, right? So checking for duplicates in the in the letter file are critical. Um, we once had a client who was adamant that they had every address perfect um, and they knew exactly, you know, they only had the a certain, the right people in their file. And lo and behold, five days later on the evening news, uh, one consumer called up the local news station because they had gotten 57 versions of the letter, right? So again, that's a cost impact to the client as well as a um, credibility impact. You know, as we talked about earlier, being crisp, clean, and accurate really demonstrates the organization has it together. Um, Next, sometimes addresses are too old, right? And so even if you have a great message, it may never reach the person. So you wanna do some, you wanna do what you can to make sure that your data file is as up to date as possible so that you can make sure you're getting to the right person. 
you know, sometimes it's uh, impossible to mail everybody, to everybody or it's too expensive. And so making sure that you're at the advertisements and the public notice that you, um, the, the, the public notice that you um, take out and, and, and the media is accurate, reflective of your brand and logo, as I mentioned before. Um, you know, also working with counsel to make sure that the letter is commensurate with the with the appropriate state laws. You know, the U.S. has a patchwork of data breach notification laws, and different states have different requirements. So, while Massachusetts requires one thing, California requires something different. And understanding those nuances and making sure that your counsel um, is advising you on on those nuances is really really critical. I think finally, you know, monitoring and understanding your return mail, if if all the letters get returned because you have uh, the wrong addresses, you spent money and you haven't done a thing. And so understanding what that looks like, I think is a really critical part of a successful data breach response. Before we go to questions, I wanna add, I wanna add a couple of things. I wanna share kind of two quick case studies. Um, first case study I'm gonna share is around a large national healthcare company who found out they had a breach and they went down a path of with, with a third party to help them. And in the 11th hour, they realized that that third party couldn't help do what they needed done. So Crow got called in and we ended up notifying over 10 million consumers. They had 91 different letter versions in 14 different languages in writing on the letters. And they required that sort of language capability change in the uh, call centers as well. They also had a significant elderly population. And so a lot of, we saw a pickup in that population who would receive the letter and call in. And because a, a significant subset of that elderly population was not uh, technologically savvy, um, it, they, there were a lot of questions and they didn't under, that population that didn't understand why they were impacted or how they were impacted. So that support that was provided in general and to that specific population set helped reduce the noise from that population or that the criticality from that population to the healthcare institute that that was our client because the people were frustrated that population was frustrated but they understood they were getting the help um i guess last from a corporate perspective um i, I think clients need to think about the aftermath of a data breach. We've talked about it pre-event, we've talked about it during event, but I think it's also important to think about what happens after afterwards. And I think a couple things to highlight on that are, are this. Um, class action start the minute you announce, class action lawyers start gathering um, their target audience the minute uh, these events happen. So we tend to work with our clients after the fact as well to make sure, because we, we've been with them through the entire event. So we're able to say, hey, um, we know who called in. We know um, how many people activated services. And all of that data becomes really, really strong evidence against class and against the class action. And many of our clients have um, been able to say, look, we did everything in our power because we communicated well and we provided the right services and we provided the right services to those impacted. And so therefore there really is no claim against our organization and the class, and, and, and you know, from this class towards our organization. So, you, you know, all, all of these pieces, both the communication, the, commu the communication, the notification and the remedy, um, as well as how the organization responds in general, are critical pieces in helping an organization deal with a data breach. With that, I, I would like to open it up if there are any questions uh, for that, for uh, Kelsey, Zach, or I, or me. It looks like questions can be submitted um, using the question option in the GoToWebinar menu. Uh, so, folks, I received a question via the chat privately, and, and um, I'll just ask, but uh, it was around 
the interaction of the PR firm with the council, and at what point does that begin? Uh, what's the order? Does council come first and PR firm next? Can you talk a little bit about that uh, sequence? Sure. So it it depends on if we're talking about pre breach or or during an active breach. If it's if it's pre breach, we'll typically be brought in alongside legal counsel um, to help plan for an event, and that way we can dovetail our responses and our strategies with that of of legal counsel. Um, if there's an active breach, uh, legal counsel will typically be hired first, um, and then we'll receive the call from them, and we'll actually be hired um, we'll be hired by the law firm so that our work is all done under privilege. Um, that's super important, especially when dealing with something where which might result in litigation down the line. Um, Infinite likes to be engaged by the law firm, and the client usually prefers that as well. Um, so we'll come in after the law firm and after the forensics team has been engaged and the investigation has begun, and we'll start prepping for all of the all of the communication elements. I think that's I think that's a great point. I think it, it post event or during an event. The more that can be contracted through counsel and run through counsel to maintain privilege in the U.S. is is certainly a best practice for all providers. Okay. Um, well, I want to thank all the panelists today. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, to all the guests, that, uh, you know, that registered. We will make both the slides and the video recording available within 48 hours. So you get an email with uh, links to download everything. Uh, and if you do have any questions, the panelist information is on the screen, or you can just reply to the address in the email you receive with the recording. Very good. Thank you all for joining us. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.